Okay, now I'm going to go through one last example using our consumer choice theory model. And what I'm going to look at is something that uh, we're all very familiar with. It's a trade-off between two goods, uh, but something that most of us, at least normal people, will have never treated like goods before. The things I'm talking about, a trade-off that we face, and we might consider goods, is consumption of goods and services, stuff that we like today. So I'll say consumption present versus consumption of stuff that we might enjoy in the future. So this down here would be consumption in the future. Now, if we spend all of our money today, that means we get to consume, let's say, this much. But that's zero future consumption because we spent all of our money today. We didn't save anything. Now, what happens if we don't consume some today? Anything we don't consume today is money that is set aside for something in the future. Now, in the future, will that money be worth exactly what it is today? We hope it'll be worth more because we would put it in something that yields some kind of an interest rate, right? some kind of a return. So if we were to imagine consuming nothing today, and that's abstract, sure, we could change that assumption, but let's just keep it simple. If we imagine consuming nothing today, the amount that we could consume in the future would be something more than what it would be if we had spent it all today, right? Because of the compounding effect of interest. So this gap should be wider than, this gap should be wider than this gap. So it might be something like out here. Now, what this means is we face this budget constraint given how much our income is between these two goods of what we can purchase. We can purchase all of this today, or we can purchase all of this today, but it's in the future that we will enjoy it. So that's the cold, hard reality we face. Now, if we get a raise, the whole thing moves out, just like it would for any other two goods. But we're not as interested in that. That's just a shift outward. We're interested in what interest rates mean to our behavior. So our behavior is a function of both our income and substitution effects. And this is the cold hard reality we face. We illustrate our psychological behavior, what's going on in our minds, this sometimes debate, sometimes conflict between income effect and substitution effect. We illustrate that with our indifference curves and they're since they're kind of psychological, touchy-feely things, they're also curved as opposed to straight. And where these two intersect, as we've said, this is what determines our consumption bundle as an individual consumer. So I'm going to say C sub P star and C sub F star. That's where we are today. But as we always do with these things, the world's going to change, right? That's what we've been doing. That's what we always seem to do. Something changes. So what I'm going to suggest changes might be, let's go ahead and, and say um, a increase in interest rates. If interest rates increase and I haven't, and I'm not doing any saving, I'm entirely up here would interest rates affect how much I could buy today? No, because I'm spending everything anyway. But if I weren't spending anything today and interest rates were higher, something happened and interest rates went up, what would that mean about the potential future consumption I was looking at enjoying before they went up compared to after they went up? It would be greater, right? Because now those higher interest rates are going to result in greater potential consumption future consumption. So, like we did with various events of new resources and things like that with the production possibilities curve, our budget constraint, which is linear unlike the production possibilities curve, our budget constraint, it would pivot outward something like this due to higher interest rates. This is a pivot point up here. I missed the mark a little bit, but that's a pivot point. And then the question is, between income and substitution, what would we do? 
how are we going to behave? Now, without examining this, we would probably conclude, most people, I think, would probably conclude, if prompted with a question like this, as follows, what would people do with higher interest rates? Most people would say they'd save more. That's probably where they would come from, but by examining this a little closer, we could explore how that might be so and how that also might not be so. That's really what we're doing here. See, for us to save more would be for the substitution effect to dominate. And how much more is how dominant the substitution effect is. Because remember, substitution starts with an S. It's the behavior that we would do if we stayed on the same indifference curve we had been on. Well, our new budget constraint is flatter because it pivoted outward. It doesn't look very good because I didn't pivot it very well. And also, it's partly because my uh, original curve was a little curved there, my original budget constraint. But it pivoted outward, so it's flatter. Well, along this curve, where are the slopes flatter? They're everywhere south of the current point of tangency. Those are flatter slopes along here. These are all steeper. This thing, the blue curve, is flatter. So if I had to stay on the same indifference curve, I would move, according to the substitution effect, I would, same indifference curve, starts with an S. I would move that way along my old indifference curve. That's what the substitution effect would have me do. Remember, thinking about substitution as its own personality, like in um, Inside Out, substitution is real reactionary. Substitution here is interest rates are lower, and substitution goes, cool, let's, cool, let's save, let's save more. That would be moving away from consumption today toward greater future consumption in the form of saving more. If you're, re if you're reducing your consumption today, by definition, you're saving more because the income, the disposable income that you and I have that we don't spend, by definition, we're saving. So substitution would be all about moving to the thing that, you know, who treated me well lately. Substitution is kind of a what have you done for me lately personality. Income is a little bit more objective. Income is all about moving to the other budget constraint. Not thinking as if they're on the same indifference curve, but going out to a different one on the other budget constraint. Other starts with a vowel, income starts with a vowel. That's how you can remember they go together, I think. So income is about moving out to this blue line. And from the, con the uh, tangent pink lines, the other line is out like that. So income is about moving this way and moving this way. So income and substitution are in agreement about greater future consumption. But look where they have a conflict. It's about what to do today. So if in this conflict income wins, you might see saving remain exactly the same as it was. Perhaps we could say we would move out a little bit on future consumption because of the interest rate effect. But the interesting thing, I think the interesting thing, is that we could see an outcome such that consumption today rises with the higher interest rates. This may stay the same, this may move out some, but if income wins the day, we could see consumption today rise due to the higher interest rates, which is not the immediate thought that most people would have about what higher interest rates would do. In other words, the person for whom this is true says, consciously or subconsciously, wow, with these higher interest rates, I can be sure that my future is secure so I can go ahead and spend more money now. 
that's the income effect being dominant. If the income effect is extraordinarily dominant, future consumption could actually fall. Um, what that would have to mean would be that future consumption is an inferior good because with this newfound income, the higher interest rate, they purchase less of it. And that's not very uh, plausible, but it's not impossible. So I hope you found that analysis and a little bit more in-depth thinking about the trade-offs we face between consumption today and consumption in the future as interesting as I did.